Russia has descended on Ukraine, subjecting its people to aerial bombardment, subjugating towns and cities, and choking off deliveries of food, medicine, and other supplies. Still, experts have said that Russian President Vladimir Putin has been caught off guard by the fact that his troops have not advanced as quickly as expected, especially to Kiev, and by the resistance of the Ukrainians. The situation is dangerous and unpredictable and nuclear weapons lurk in the background as an existential threat. Welcome to International Horizons, a podcast of the Ralph Bunch Institute for International Studies that brings scholarly and diplomatic expertise to bear on our understanding of a wide range of international issues. My name is John Torpy, and I'm director of the Ralph Bunch Institute at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. We're fortunate to have with us today Julie George, Associate Professor of Political Science at Queens College and the CUNY Graduate Center. Her research focuses on ethnic politics in the former Soviet Union, and she's author of the book The Politics of Ethnic Separatism in Russia and Georgia from 2009, as well as having written numerous articles and chapters, book chapters on ethnic politics in and around Russia. Thanks so much for joining us today, Julie George. Thanks for having me. Great to have you with us. Unfortunate occasion for for this discussion, but we have to try to understand what really is going on in Russia and Ukraine. So there's a debate about whether or not Putin is acting rationally or is evil or a madman. And I think, you know, this is a question that we need to think more about. I mean, do you agree with the widespread view that started with George Kennan, you know, the famous author of the long telegram about containing the Soviet Union after World War II and you know, long thought to be the dean of Russia specialists in the State Department and the Foreign Service. George Kennan, you know, argued many years ago that NATO expansion was a needless provocation to the Russians. And to what extent then is what Putin is doing, you know, irrational? What do you think he's trying to achieve with this offensive? There is a lot in that question because uh, there there are a couple of things in there. One is a commentary about NATO expansion. What is this uh, terminology of uh, provocation and the needlessness of it? And the other is the irrationality of, of Vladimir Putin and what his intentions are. And I think it's important really to break those down into parts because it helps us get a sense of how we might go about understanding his mindset. You know, I was I was reading something the other day. The the argumentation was we should take him at his word. Like you take the autocrat at his word and and try to understand what he means when he says why he's doing a certain thing. Uh, and Vladimir Putin very clearly said when he rationalized, um, made his argument to the Russian people and to the world as to why he was going to start a war in Ukraine was that he wanted to rebuild the Soviet Union and that the calling back on his previous commentary that the uh, he was his position was that the the greatest geostrategic tragedy of the 20th century was the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, he wants to redress that tragedy and correct it as he understands that. And so in that sense, there's no inconsistency here. The one thing we do in political science is when we talk about something like rationality, we look at consistency over time. Does someone act consistently over time? And what we can see with Putin is both a period of, of a constant and then a dynamic. The constant is the intent. The constant is the concern. Uh, his uh, viewpoint expressed last week um, in his address was that the collapse of the Soviet Union showcased a weakness for Russia, uh, and it was his intention to address that weakness. What has changed for him, so that hasn't changed. What has changed, though, is his risk assessment. We've never seen this kind of acceptance of overwhelming risk, of overwhelming punishment by Putin before. Typically, his actions have been uh, a bit more diffident, a bit more careful, uh, making sure that the ground is solid before he steps forward uh, with any sort of a really aggressive move or out of something that is 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 not in line with a de facto status. And that's what we see that's changed. Uh, but I don't see irrationality there. I see a, a change of tactic and a change of willingness to accept risk. And here we see a great willingness to accept risk. So that's the point about rationality. I don't, I don't think this is irrational. Well, you think it's consistent with 
you know, a long-standing grievance, if that's the right way to describe this, or a, a long-standing sense that things went badly wrong when the Soviet Union collapsed. So I guess one question might be, you know, where does Ukraine fit into a project that is about reconstructing, you know, the the, the Soviet Union slash, you know, the Russian Empire, and and what might come beyond that? It's a good question. To just clarify, this isn't a grievance. Putin feels aggrieved, uh, but the rightfulness and the morality of that grievance is 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 contested by international law. You know, Ukraine is a sovereign state, and it is that sovereignty that Putin is rejecting and trying to overcome in this moment. So in that sense, uh, if when your neighbor as a sovereign country that wants to pursue its own foreign policy and its own domestic policy um, aggrieves an imperial actor, the problem is for the imperial actor, not for the sovereign state. For for Putin, in wanting to resolve this grievance and in looking at Ukraine, Ukraine is the largest example and largest embodiment of Russian weakness after the collapse of the Soviet Union because Ukraine because Ukraine is so has been historically so important for Russia's understanding of itself as its imperial self uh it's also of course very important for agricultural and geostrategic reasons and also for Putin because in in the way that he understands Ukrainians and Ukrainianness and U, the Ukrainian state is to understand them as perhaps fallen Russians, uh, the the terminology that he's using, the discussions, the the way he addresses issues in Ukraine and also in Belarus, incidentally, uh, when he was making his argument for the invasion of of Ukraine, was that he wanted to unite the Russian people, um, and in that framing, both Ukrainians and Belarusians are understood by Putin to be Russians. So for Putin, there is no Ukraine. Ukraine is a mythology. It's a constructed entity um, that is actually part of Russia. And so he wants, with this invasion, he wants to correct this inaccuracy in his understanding of, of what the, that reality is. From an international law perspective, of course, the Russian Federation recognized Ukrainian independence as a Ukrainian state. Uh, they've entered in many international agreements with Ukraine. Uh, and so Putin's understanding this, this lack, this resistance to the notion of an independent entity of Ukraine with Ukrainians in it, uh, kind of fall, flies in the face of Russia's own foreign policy making the last 20 years. So, um, I, I mean, I do want to, you know, have you get into the issue, uh, that we, that I sort of ended my question with about, you know, where things might go beyond Ukraine if the project is essentially to reconstruct the Russian Empire. But, you know, in some measure, we can get into that, I suppose, by asking this question that we didn't really finish because my first question had too many parts <laughs> uh, about whether, you know, NATO expansion was a provocation. And, you know, to me, the other part of that question, I suppose, is, you know, why, if that's been kind of looming in the atmosphere for two decades, why is that, or longer, I mean, uh, why is that, uh, why is he acting on this now? I, I think the heart of the answer to your question is actually in the question itself that you've just mentioned, is in this timing. The criticism about NATO expansion is understandable from an international relations perspective. And IR scholars have this thing they call the security dilemma. And what the security dilemma is, is it, it stems from a notion that we cannot understand the intentions of our adversaries. And so we must always perceive them as threatening any action that they take. Our first perception must be one of defensiveness against it, even though we might not fully understand it. The heart of the security dilemma and the problem of the security dilemma intellectually, uh, is that, you know, any action taken by a particular state is going to be perceived accurately or inaccurately by its adversary as offensive, as trying to move in. For two states whose interest is in peace, then the security dilemma is a tragedy, right? Because one peaceful state will make an action and it's going to be perceived by its adversary as an offensive action or as something or as a threat when it's not intended to be so. So then the notion of it, it kind of stems into arms race sorts of politics where one arms oneself to defend against one's adversary. The adversary sees that, arms themselves to defend against them. 
they're their adversary. And then the first adversary, the first actor sees that rearmament and says, oh, my gosh, they're really trying to threaten us. From that perspective, from the security dilemma perspective, presuming that both Russia and the members of NATO, in this case, probably the United States of America, largely since the U.S. is really pushing some of these um, more expansive tactics. In that condition, if they are both status quo powers, if they're both powers that are peaceful and don't intend to expand, the expansion of NATO might be seen by Russia as a provocation because they cannot into it. They cannot interpret it as being a peaceful act as opposed to an aggressive act. That whole notion of it being provocative or needlessly provocative comes from the baseline condition that they're, they're status quo powers. There's no intention on either side to be aggressive. But Putin's intention since taking office in 2000 has been to rebuild the Soviet Union. And as such, I think for the countries like Poland, for the countries like Ukraine, uh, joining NATO isn't a provocation. It's a it's their only lifeline for independence and sustained sovereignty over their own territories, since their neighbor is that expansionary power, and that expansionary power is seeking to expand into specifically, um, definitely Ukraine, obviously, um, and perhaps Poland as well, and other of the you know Belarus, Moldova, uh, the Caucasus, um, other of the um, post-Soviet and and the Baltic states, others of the post-Soviet republics. At the time of this invasion, the Ukrainian admission status, admission into NATO status had not been moving forward for years. The annexation of Crimea, the secessionist violence, and the Donbass and Luhansk and and Donetsk, the self-determination movements there, um, some would call them false flag uh, movements or puppet states, uh, depending on one's perspective. Uh, These were all kind of deterrence for NATO expansion into Ukraine and had been such for eight years since 2014. Uh, so given that, the the argumentation that NATO expansion or NATO policy caused this, this incursion, this invasion of Ukraine, uh, just doesn't hold up to logic because there is no change uh, in the expansion. And here we see a change in the policy. My suspicion is that Putin um, is well. We're all aging. Um, he's coming up on seventy. Um, he's worried about his legacy, and I think he underestimated the strength of Biden. He certainly underestimated the strength of Volodymyr Zelensky, um, and he underestimated the the unity of NATO. NATO had become disunified under the the Trump administration in a bit. The, the we weren't all speaking in concert, and I think he misunderstood the the or misassessed the likelihood of NATO coming together in solidarity um, over Ukraine, um, which was a miscalculation on his part. Well, he certainly does seem to have brought the West together. I mean, not, you know, automatically, but, you know, with leadership by Joe Biden, not least. Um, and, you know, so he may have miscalculated, uh, you know, or, or misunderstood a perception of the West as weak, uh, as not likely to step over certain, you know, shall we call them red lines, uh, you know, that Biden has said repeatedly just said in the other uh, in the State of the Union address the other night that he would not be sending troops to Ukraine. So, uh, I mean, is that kind of what explains the timing of this? I mean, why Putin thought, you know, this is the time? I mean, it seems it might have been better to, um, you know, to do this at, you know, full American uh, polarization, i.e., you know, under Trump, uh, who seemed to be his good buddy anyway. Um, so why, you know, is was he running out of time from his own perspective or something like that? How would you see that? It's very difficult to know. I, I've seen a lot of rumors about various things that might um, make his time horizon seem shorter as opposed to longer. Um, and of course, mortality catches up with us all. I think the you know, when you're when you are when one is an imperial power, one is looking for openings um, and chinks in armors. And it, I think it's inappropriate or it's it's not good to think of these things as what the West has done to invite this, because any opening for an imperial power is an opportunity. The other thing is Putin doesn't understand democracy. He, he doesn't understand. He, he, he looks at democracy as far as I understand. Now, I don't have an avenue into his mind. I've, I've not talked to Putin. But all of the, his commentary about democratic movements indicate that he fundamentally misunderstands the role of the population in asserting uh, opposition to state control. 
and he looks at democratic regimes that have to tack and consider their popular opinion as weak. So for for Putin, looking at a Joe Biden who comes into power uh, with a great deal of a partisan gap uh, with the uh, Stop the Steal campaigns and, and various other components, and then immediately one of the first foreign policy actions taken to pull out of Afghanistan too much too much criticism at the kind of conduct of that of that withdrawal. Putin, I presume, looked at those things, put them together, and presumed that Joe Biden was a very very weak president and would not be able to to build public opinion um, in order to take on um, take on the the task of supporting Ukraine. Europe on this as well, the Americans kind of led, we led with the first argumentation for sanctions and our, our initial salvos with sanctions were rather, were, were criticized as weak and, and perhaps not enough. I mean, we did have a, a desire to have a, an escalation campaign so that we would be able to modulate the strategy. Uh, but Europe also was diffident at first. Uh, and then um, Zelensky uh, addressed um, addressed them and and Zelensky, I think, convinced the Europeans that they needed to take a stronger stand. And you can see the foreign policy of Germany shifted um, within within hours uh, and into something that was was just fundamentally different than what we've seen um, in 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 recent memory in the last 30 years, at least. And, and so I think that Biden has has unified. Uh, but but Zelensky, I think, also um we should we should recognize his ability to, to work that European room. And and he is someone who understands democracy and he understands the Western commitments to it. And he also understands uh, when the West wants to step back from engagement. Uh, and I think that by playing on both that desire to do more um, and the limitations that that the West feels for what we can do for Ukraine, uh, actually put him in a much better strategic position than Putin ever expected. So Biden has, and then Biden then is able to riff off of that and build that and build into that that unity to create um, a much more um, unified Western, indeed international, right? Because this is bigger than just Japan. This is um, this is bigger than than just the West uh, response. And I think that that works to Biden's favor because now it's not just about NATO. You know, this is a world condemnation of an aggressive act. Right. Uh, but let's go back to the sort of heart of the matter, uh, ethnically speaking. Um, tell us about uh, how, you know, Russians and Ukrainians view each other. I mean, right now there's a lot of understandable hostility uh, among Ukrainians, uh, you know, vis-a-vis Russians who are dropping bombs on their cities and that sort of thing. Um, you know, how how should we understand the sort of ethnic antagonism? How, fa- how far back does it go? Because I think mean, it seems as though this is all going to shape, you know, the long term, the long game, so to speak, uh, of the this conflict, I mean, which is maybe starting out, you know, surprisingly well for the Ukrainians and not so well for the for the Russians. But, you know, the Russians still have a lot of weaponry and not to mention nuclear weapons. And, um, you know, who knows how long this could all play out. So I'm sort of curious if you could set the stage for us about how these people kind of think about each other. Sure. It's going to sound ironic, but they love each other. They're brothers. And uh, they... The, the locus, the ethnic locus of this for Putin um, is that he understands Ukrainians to be Russians. Uh, and so the the sad, sad irony of this is that it is born from more of a feeling of togetherness than a feeling of apartness. And, and we see we see similar turn lines, actually, in, in, in um, the former Yugoslavia and, and some of the conflicts there in, in the 90s. So I. I think it would be inappropriate to think of this as ethnic antagonism, but there's certainly ethnic contours to it, um, in part because for Putin, um, as as the aggressor here, as the designer of the aggression, his argument is about the solidarity and the unification of the Russians. Uh, And there is a disagreement, of course, in this sense, ethnically, in that the Ukrainians do not feel themselves to be Russians. They feel themselves to be Ukrainians. And that's something that a Putin um, cannot countenance. Uh, but the the locus of that is a feeling of togetherness and, and a rejection of apartness, uh, which uh, which does not come from a place of hostility. Um, it comes from a place of ownership. 
Overlapping that are the state interests of Russia as a civic entity um, and as Ukraine as a civic entity. And the fact of the matter is, in Ukraine, there are both ethnic Russians and ethnic Ukrainians who are defending the civic Ukrainian state. And so there, the antagonism isn't against Russians ethnically. It's against those that support the Russian state in its aggression against Ukraine. Now, for everyday Russians who are who are now in this position of having to decide to uh, love their autocrat or love their brothers, um, that they're in a, an impossible condition. And, and you can see this with the just the, the devastation of, you know, there are these the the videos of the young Russian soldiers who are are taken in by Ukrainian families and fed because they haven't eaten because they didn't have enough food or rations for their invasion. And they're calling her home and saying, Mom, I'm in Ukraine. I didn't even know this was going to happen. Uh, you can see they're flabbergasted by this. This is devastating for them. Many, many Russians have many, many family members in Ukraine. And and so for for the everyday Russian who who maybe not be hooked into this kind of radical nationalism of Putin, which is not a standard nationalist trope in, in Russia necessarily, not something that's shared universally. Uh, this is a, this is a hardship, um, I think beyond comparison or beyond, beyond expression. And then finally, of course, adding to all of this is the, uh, the cult of personality that Putin has cu- cultivated over the last 22 years, um, since he became president in, um, 2000. And then, you know, his, uh, his larger than life persona as a savior of Russia. Uh, so it, it causes a bit of a, a mind problem when one has to shift so quickly, um, to think of one's savior is, is now, um, the holder of one's devastation. Um, and then finally, the fact that it is an authoritarian regime, uh, with propaganda, um, shouted from every corner. And as such, the everyday Russian in this, in this moment, um, is uh, is going to be torn in a thousand different directions with a great deal of uncertainty as to what's going forward at the time period when, incidentally, their entire economy is collapsing. Right. Yes, I heard a woman from, I believe, this uh, radio station that was being shut down, Echo Moscow or something yeah, like Echo that. Yeah, Echo Moscow. Um, you know, I think the person interviewing her said, you know, what's the future hold? And she says, North Korea. And that was a rather depressing thought. Uh, but I, but it, this all raises for me uh, the question of, you know, how seriously should we take the, you know, the opposition to the war that has sprouted up in many Russian cities? Uh, you know, how significant uh, a thing is this? Um, you know, some of the scenarios that people are projecting uh, from the current situation, you know, involve... Putin basically being chased out of office either by a popular, you know, rebellion of some sort or by the oligarchs who, you know, tire of his rule. Uh, I mean, how do you see, you know, the support or opposition uh, for the war, you know, in in Russia and, and how do you see that developing? I think there's less support for the war and more fear of what's to come next and also an uncertainty. I, the, the everyday Russian has a great deal of uncertainty about the war because they have very little access to news um, and they're predisposed to love Putin. I mean, he's been very popular. Um, In fact, he was fairly popular when the war began. So the the notion that he's doing this for a a domestic audience, yeah, maybe a domestic audience, but I think he's more doing it for his legacy uh, because his, uh, his popular support had not faded beyond, you know, below 60%, I think I was looking at public opinion polls at the time. With with authoritarian leaders, we basically, with they, they don't rely on elections for legitimacy. They have to rely on um, other components for legitimacy. And for the first 10 years of Putin's presidency in Russia, his legitimacy stemmed from his ability to stabilize the economic system and the political system after kind of the chaos of the 1990s. Uh, but that only went so far because the mechanism that he did it was through corruption and co-optation of oligarchs, um, the nationalization of the oil and gas industry. Uh, and with the nationalization of the oil and gas industry, the Russian economy was never able to fully develop and diversify. Um, and without that, that meant that the continued economic growth that was so prevalent in the early, the first decade of the 2000s began to decline. And so we see that decline happening after 2010. You see a steady decline um, of, uh, of, of GDP. You see recessionist pressures in Russia. And so what that does is that it it cuts away at that claim that he has uh, for authority. 
So that that's no longer available for him because he still has to pay off his loyalists, his, his co-opted uh, folks to maintain a system. And so that means he can't really do a lot to diversify that economy because he has to choose where his investments are. And it's smarter in an authoritarian regime to invest in your loyalists than it is to invest in the longer term payoff of economic development and um, popular electoral prestige because your elections don't matter. So as those fade away, um, he's left with a couple other tools for maintaining legitimacy. One is repression, um, propaganda. So you, you cut off people's availability of information so they only see what you see um, or you want them to see so you can create yourself as a hero in their world. Um, and through co-optation, um, making sure you have a, a strong a surrounding group of siloviki, of, of uh, the military and security personnel um, the cultivated from his KGB days into the intelligence services today. Um, and then also rich oligarchs who are kind of helping fund the entire mission. With the currency crisis, of course, in Ukraine, he's going to lose his oligarchs, but he's expecting this. Um, or, sorry, the currency crisis as a result of the invasion of Ukraine and the sanctions, he's going to lose his oligarchs. But he still has his Soloviki, which means that means he has a third tool, and that is his repression. Um, and so. So can you just can, quickly say what sorry. the Siloviki are? <laughs> the Siloviki are uh, a, a, an inner circle uh, that are uh, part of the security structure in current day Russia. Uh, Putin, before he was um, president, uh, before the collapse of the Soviet Union, was a KGB official in eastern Germany in Dresden, um, which in which was quite a high post, actually, at the time. And uh, so many of his first inner circle come from that community, not from an oligarchic economic community. Um, and as such, their uh, their interest levels are not as they're not as focused on the financial prestige and the financial payoff uh, of the mission. They, they share that ideological vision of the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, and as such, you know, the seizure of yachts, as exciting as it is for outsiders to watch, uh, doesn't necessarily cut into that central group. Uh, that um, that are that are supporting him. The other thing about the Siloviki is that because they are uh, they are feed in both the intelligence and the security communities, uh, these are going to be the arms of coercion and, and repression that we're going to see um, unveil within um, within Russia as the the kind of the other. Like if we imagine a tripod of authoritarian power, cult of personality or four part cult of personality, um, economic um, growth, uh, co-optive oligarchs. Um, and repression, uh, what we see here is a teetering, um, a teetering structure as the cult of personality goes away, as people realize that Putin is invading and, and murdering, you know, leading the murder, mass murder of Ukrainians um, in cities, uh, the cult of personality begins to fall away. The, the economic growth is falling away. The collapse of the currency is 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 quickly advancing that. Uh, the undermining of the oligarchs, the economic oligarchs, what's left? Repression. Uh, and, and Putin has no desire, of course, to leave power and the costs. I mean, the cost of holding power for authoritarian leaders is always quite high. There's no pathway out of power. Uh, and lacking that pathway out of power, uh, Putin, um, especially now with this aggression in Ukraine, is looking is the option for a Gaddafi sort of uh, expulsion is high. And, you know, I don't know if it's on YouTube, uh, Gaddafi pulled um, out of a, a convoy and, and murdered in the streets um, in, in a fairly um, horrific way. Uh, and this is this is an outcome of authoritarian power. There's no quick way um, to leave to leave authority for authoritarian leaders. And uh, this scenario, of course, is something that Putin absolutely wants to avoid, just like the the, the Hitler scenario of the um, suicide in the bunker. And and I think it's important that we recognize just the fear that's associated with being authoritarian leaders. We often think of them as being people who instill fear, and certainly Putin's actions are instilling a lot of fear. Uh, but a lot of those actions that he's taken come from his own fears. And, and to, to not recognize that is to not understand um, many of the, the kind of stimuli that he's responding to. Right. Interesting. So, um, you know, we, we sort of take for granted that the uh, information coming out of Russia is disinformation. Um, and, you know, there are many reasons, obviously, to think that that would be the case. Um, but I wonder about, you know, the accuracy of the information that we're getting out of Ukraine in general, sort of from both sides. I mean, I'm not saying anybody's necessarily lying, but, you know, there obviously is a kind of interest in, you know, saying things that will 
bolster the courage of the Ukrainians as they face a, a rather desperate situation. And I wonder what you would say about that. I mean, how how reliable is the information that we're getting out of uh, out of this uh, wartime setting. I mean, it's still early. There's a lot of, you know, sort of fog of war kind of things going on, it seems. You know, can we count on reliable, accurate information coming out of there? No. <laughs> no, we can't. Uh, and, and, and for two reasons. I mean, one, as you say, the fog of war. The, we, we see snippets uh coming from people's phones uh and then one can look back and see how the those those videos were actually taken at a different time um and they're just kind of framed in the, in this particular place uh the the kind of tiktokness of the war uh is is fascinating um but the tiktokness of it is also very individualized like it's decentralized this isn't a, a ukrainian propaganda machine that is working at government circles these are individual actors who are pushing a particular narrative one that of course is understandable um of of the Ukrainian underdog, the West Americans love the underdog, and so there is something very, um, very appealing about these images. And uh, of course, if one is under siege, uh, using that, um, I don't, I don't find anything morally uh, suspect about about that impulse. At the at the governmental level, when you're looking at a much more concerted sort of image making, right? Zelensky is, I mean, he's. He's many things, but he's a performer. Um, he understands audience. He understands exactly who he's talking to. He understands exactly the way he looks. Uh, and, um, and now is a moment for him to embody that. Uh, do I think that he is embodying it falsely? No, absolutely not. I mean, the thing that he is embodying is a man who is trying to, uh, win a war against a giant. Um, and and doing whatever he can to 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 do that um, and to achieve that. Um, if he wasn't being genuine, he would have accepted the ride from the Americans. Uh, and and I think it's important to to realize that the way we present ourselves uh, in in moments of of when people are when we have an audience like I have an audience now you have an audience we're presenting ourselves in a different way um or we're presenting ourselves in a particular way because we are aware of our audience it doesn't mean that we're less genuine than what we are I have noted that uh the Ukrainian official figures they mention individual heroes by name they uh so Ukrainians who have died during the war a uh, Ukrainian soldiers by name um, and in small numbers, like here are 15 heroes, uh, some of whom died, some of whom did not die. Uh, they mentioned the civilian deaths, especially all the children who are dying. Uh, and they mentioned the Russian deaths, the Russian soldiers, how many Russian soldiers um, have been killed. And the numbers are huge, at least the ones that are listed. I don't know if they're accurate, but they seem quite large. There is no discussion of Ukrainian soldier deaths. And, and that is, I think, an interesting omission. But again, one that makes sense uh, because they don't want to showcase probably um, how how extensive their their military capacity has been whittled away by the Russian onslaught. Sure. And the numbers of Russian deaths have been were delayed in coming out, as I understand it, uh, for a while. Then they felt some pressure, I guess, to release some numbers. And, you know, they're widely regarded as wildly understated. Right. Uh, I, I don't know what you mean, but when you say Lord, the Ukrainian you know, battle deaths are large. I don't know what number. I presume they are. Or, I presume they are because they're not being listed. But you haven't seen a specific no, number. I've seen none. Or, I see. Okay. Yeah, so I'm, I mean, I'm noting that they're not there. Right. Uh, but I can only imagine if the Russian battle deaths are in the five thousands. I, I don't know. I, I, unless this is Henry V and Agincourt, I, I imagine. I mean, they may not be commensurate, uh, but just. Given the firefights that have to generate uh, those numbers of fatalities, uh, it's hard to say. And it's also probably hard, actually, for the Ukrainians to count because uh, so many of their uh, people in the field are actually civilians or, or paramilitaries that have just called up. So who counts as a real soldier versus uh um, a veteran being called up versus, uh, you know, the grandmothers with guns that we see, um, you know, on, on the on the TikTok war? Uh, I imagine it's hard for them actually to discern and count with any uh, realistic accuracy at this point um, how many of each and, and and kind of the uncertainty of how to report that is probably also profound. Sure. 
So um, our time is waning, so I, I, I'm afraid I want to throw a question at you that you know you may not feel like you're an expert on, but uh, you're more of an expert on it than I am. So I'm going to ask you, you know, under what circumstances do you think you know l- nuclear weapons might be introduced into this conflict? I mean, there's been some, you know, halting and not very successful, uh, you know, discussions between the Russians and the Ukrainians. Uh, I consider that a hopeful sign, even if they haven't really amounted to much yet. Uh, but this could all go south in a lot of ways and go out, go drag out for a long time. And uh, I guess I just wonder, you know, how you envision, you know, is that a possibility that you're, you know, you think we ought to be reckoning with? Well, it's always a possibility when one deals with a nuclear power, one has to recognize the tools in their tool chest. And that is one of the tools in in, in the tool chest. Uh, but I think the conditions would have to change so vastly, it's hard to anticipate um, what would happen. Um, the nuclear weapons are a deterrent, right? You know, you guys don't strike us because we can strike you back with this level of of devastation that is just so profoundly um, destabilizing that you can't even contemplate its use, right? Like that, that is the point of the nuclear weapon as a deterrent. And so Putin saying, you know, I'm ready to have a nuclear war. He is communicating to the U S and other Western nuclear holding powers that they should not intervene into this conflict militarily because he's willing to use these nuclear weapons. So he is deterring the U S um, in specific, uh, from entering in the conflict militarily. But what's also interesting is Biden has made it very clear that he has no interest in entering the conflict militarily. He has said it from the beginning. So the nuclear card that Putin is playing is actually spoken into an audience that has already accepted it before he even threw it down, right? We know, Biden knows, he's made very clear, we're going to protect our Polish allies, we're going to protect all of the allies of NATO, we're going to make sure that Estonia and Latvia are protected, uh, but we are not going to uh, use military, we are not going to intervene militarily for Ukraine. So that was clear from the beginning. So the point of this messaging, right, um, leads to two things. One, maybe Putin uh, recognizing his miscalculation in Ukraine uh, is wanting to reassure himself that the West is going to be deterred because why else do it? Or um, he or, or he's doing it for another reason. He's signaling somebody else. Um, I think the risk for the biggest risk here is the desperation of Putin to stay in power uh, and not be removed. Uh, and to uh, not be killed. And I think that that his domestic situation, um, as protected as it is by his own authoritarianism, is increasingly costly for him. The the I think the thing that is uncertain with everybody is that it's very clear that Putin took on this war for maximal advantage to take the entirety of Ukraine. Um, maybe not territorially, but in terms of political influence. Uh, but he's going to face, uh, you know, the, the, there's this first aggression, right, which is the the taking. And once they take, if they do, if they are successful, uh, which uh, most people think they will be ultimately um, in terms of the quick, the quick seizure, uh, then there's the occupation, which will be necessary because the Ukrainian insurgency is going to be quite powerful and it's going to be quite sustained. Uh, and so the this this really extends the Russian military capacity, especially since it's been so tested already. Um, its ability to maintain that occupation is very, very much in doubt, even though the initial seizure um, is, I mean, it's it's not going the way the Russians expected to at all. It's taking a lot longer. Uh, so, it, you know, I, I feel that saying, well, they'll probably, you know, end up taking it, but that's what um, U.S. intelligence U.S. intelligence officials are predicting at some point uh, the Russians will be over to overtake the Ukrainian initial defense, but the insurgency will last a very long time. Um, and the, the you know, the, the Ukrainians are ready for that um, and they will receive Western support for that insurgency at the same time that uh, the economic war is continuing. And that's one that is being waged by the West. Well, Obviously, this is a fluid and tragic situation that's going to take some time to play out. 
but I uh, want to thank Professor Julie George for her insights into the Russian war on Ukraine. Remember to rate and subscribe to International Horizons on SoundCloud, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. I want to thank Osvaldo Mena Aguilar for his technical assistance, as well as to acknowledge Duncan McKay for sharing his song, International Horizons, as the theme music for the show. I also want to thank Meryl Sovner for helping put today's episode together. This is John Torpy saying thanks for joining us, and we look forward to having you with us for the next episode of International Horizons. 